A little bit about permits. Um, if there's other questions about that, I can, I can field some of those. Um, and then we'll get into some example projects. Um, I do have some photos of some Blair County sites that I know nothing about. I just tacked them on the end here. If we have time at the end and someone knows something about it, we can talk about them. If not, that's fine too. So, um, so in the context of, of MS4 compliance and meeting TMDL targets, why do we want to talk about stream restoration? Um, well, first of all, where are the sediment nutrients coming from? Um, and what are the largest sort of loading sources of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment? Um, and again, Tom sort of stole my thunder with some of the, the data that he was providing, but I've got some other examples showing um, just how much of, of that loading is coming from, from stream banks and, and how we can, we can address that. Um, so we want to know where the loads are coming from, and then we, we want to know what's the most efficient way to, to handle those loads from a, from a load reduction standpoint and from a cost-effectiveness standpoint. So this is um, a table from the, the TMDL um, that Center for Watershed Protection did, the TMDL plan, uh, for the little juniata, and I don't know if you can see all those numbers. This is, this is uh, mimicking the, the MapShed data output screen. So if you run MapShed, you get um, this output that lists all the different land uses and then other um, load sources uh, down here at the bottom, and it goes through um, shows you the area of the different land uses and then sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus loading. So that's what you're seeing here. And I just circled the highest ones um, in, in each category, sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus. Um, so the highest contributor of, of stream bank, uh, or of, of sediment is stream banks. Uh, the highest contributor um, in the Little Juniata watershed of, of nitrogen and phosphorus is actually groundwater. So there's there's dissolved nitrogen and, and phosphorus in the groundwater, and you're getting continuous base flow discharge uh, that's creating that loading. Um, and you can look at some of the, some of the other um, sources, but that's fairly typical of what we see. Um, there, there are zeros here for farm animals. That's probably a function of, that's an item that you have to enter manually in the map shed, um, and the data is difficult to get because um, if you talk to the conservation district, that's all, um, it's all protected information, and that's it's kind of the way the system works. So it's, it's challenging, and we've done some estimating to try to get some of those numbers between some records that are available. But um, So just to summarize what, what you're seeing there, the highest loading sources, nitrogen and phosphorus are groundwater, 60 to 30% of the total, and 70% and of the sediment is coming from stream banks. Um, the stream bank contribution, um, nitrogen, uh, it only shows up at about 5%, which is third, and phosphorus um, at 18%, which is also third. Um, the, the one quirky thing about MapShed is that somehow it doesn't correlate the actual nitrogen and phosphorus content in that sediment that's eroding. Um, and there's some standard numbers, uh, they're actually cited in the, the expert panel report. Um, that, that have been developed for um, average nitrogen and phosphorus content of uh, eroded sediment from stream banks. And when you multiply the, the, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus concentration by the amount of the sediment, you actually get a higher number than what MapShed re re returns. Um, so if, if you plug in those numbers, the, the phosphorus contribution jumps to 54% and the nitrogen up to 12%. So uh, again, it's, MapShed is a, uh, is a model. It's not perfect. It's it's as good as what you put into it, um, maybe so. Uh, but it's it's a good tool. You just have to understand how to interpret the data. Uh, the total urban contribution. So all of the uh, the urban uh, classifies it as mixed use or residential. Um, the total nitrogen seven percent, phosphorus fourteen percent, and sediment two percent. So the relative load, especially on sediment and from your urban sources. It's fairly low, so you can only you can only reduce that that load so much, um, and and that alone isn't going to get you to the, the load reduction targets that you have. Um, similar example, this one's for the Kikalka Creek watershed, um, Lancaster, Lebanon, Berks counties. Uh, we did a um, a baseline study for uh, ten municipalities in the Kikalka Creek watershed. 
basically to give them a, a tool to develop their, their CVPRPs, um, Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Pro Plan, if, if I throw out uh, acronyms that you're not familiar with, just holler. Um, but, uh, so, so this gave them baseline loading uh, by, by township um, and a template then to develop their, their Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plan. And we see the same results here. The stream bank um, erosion is your, your primary source of sediment. Uh, groundwater is your primary source of nitrogen. Um, and in this case, farm animals, uh, livestock is your primary source of phosphorus. Um, and again, those numbers were, were estimated based on uh, information from NRCS, the Conservation District, some evaluation of aerial photography. So again, your stream banks are your, your big source of, of sediment, 64%, um, groundwater and livestock by the other two. Your stream bank contribution and nitrogen is 2%, um, which was the fourth place, uh, fourth highest phosphorus at 9%, which was the second highest, uh, and sediment again 64%. Uh, the, the items that were ahead of nitrogen in that, in that were um, cropland, so basically runoff from, from cropland, and I'm drawing a blank on the other one. Basically, I uses that are that are going to be ahead of it there. So Ben, that was that chart was a one townships plan. Um, this chart is, is actually watershed wide. We had uh, we generated a separate one. You can divide it out by by municipality. So, okay. so the model is GIS based, so you can you can cut it up then uh, by municipality. So, so that's the, the sediment primarily and, and also a significant amount of the nitrogen and phosphorus are coming from the stream banks. Um, so just to look at the, the cost benefit comparison of stream bank erosion, or stream bank restoration uh, versus uh, other means of getting that same load reduction. Um, this is a 5.7 acre stream and floodplain restoration. Uh, it's actually land as homes. You'll, you'll see more detail on this later. Uh, but Design permit construction costs about $785,000, so pretty big price tag. Um, the sediment load reduction of 75 tons per year, um, to get that same load reduction from rain gardens, um, you need 121 acres at a cost of $7.6 million. So, um, and, and urban, urban forest riparian buffer, you need 518 acres at a cost of $6.4 million. So to get big chunks of, of sediment load reduction, um, while it's an expensive way to go, it, it's much cheaper per pound uh, than some of the other alternatives. And nitrogen shows up similar result, 800 pounds per year of nitrogen. Uh, that's the equivalent of 42 acres of rain gardens at 1.1 million. Um, and 94 acres of forested riparian buffer at 1.1 million. Uh, the cost, uh, and uh, load reduction data from um, the uh, Lancaster County Clean Water Consortium uh, project. Um, Tetra Tech uh, ran the data. Um, this is based on, on Bay models. So you could use a different model, you could use different approaches, and you'll probably get different results in terms of cost and, and actual load reductions, but it shows you the order of magnitude that we're looking at. Ben, in that case, the land is homes, the mm -hmm. developer, Paid out seven hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. What, from the, just knowing developers, what was the incentive that inspired them to spend that much money? Well, what was the return for them? I'm really it, curious. This is this, and I'll, I'll have a slide on that in a little bit, but okay. I'll steal my own thunder here. That oh, sorry. That, no, that's okay. This is a retirement community, and they're landlocked, so they don't have anywhere to go, um, but but up and and preserve as much buildable land as they can. Um, so. The, the financial incentive on their end was the ability to build 11 additional cottage units, um, which was a return of about $9 million for them. So okay. it made sense financially uh, uh, on their end. And this was not a project that, that, that was really 
nutrient sediment load reduction was way down on the list in terms of priority here. This was a stormwater management project. Um, this is just a byproduct. So, so what is stream restoration? Um, and looking at the, the TMDL plan, uh, there's a number of, of projects identified and there's uh, different terms thrown around. Um, bank stabilization, there's floodplain reconnection, natural channel design, um, we talked about regenerative stormwater conveyance, buffers, all these things. They get thrown around a lot, they mean a lot of different things to different people, so um, I'm going to try to, to sort of put a handle on it, but really they're all tools in the toolbox, and you need um, different tools to do various jobs, um, and you can one may be more important on one job, and one may be more important on another job, but you need, you need a full array of tools to get uh, the job done. And you also have different types of tools. Um, I have one of, one of these, and it's pretty handy. And you can do a lot, you can drive a lot of screws with, it's a, an impact driver. Uh, you drive a lot of screws, you can drill holes, um, you can do all sorts of things. It'll run you a couple hundred bucks for a good one, um, but, but you can run a whole lot more screws than you can uh, a couple dollar screwdriver. That doesn't make that screwdriver obsolete. Um, I still have a dozen or so tools, uh, different types of screwdrivers in my toolbox, and you need them when you need them. So the point is that there's different tools. Some are more expensive. Some can, can carry a heavier load. But you need a, a wide array, array of tools um, at your disposal, depending on the situation and the conditions. Um, I'll throw out some definitions here. Um, from various sources, uh, and, and uh, some of these were covered before, but stream bank stabilization, NRCS's definition is basically treatments used to stabilize and protect banks and streams. It could be structures, it could be grading, it could be materials, uh, it could be vegetation. So some, some means of stabilizing stream banks. So it's pretty generic. Um, natural channel design. Um, Fluvial geomorphic based restoration method that uses data collection, modeling techniques, and stable reference channels in the design of ideal channel configurations. That's the Keystone and Stream Team definition. Um, and uh, Tom talked about you know, Dave Ross. This is Dave Ross was sort of the pioneer of this. Um, a lot of time, uh, Dave's name gets attached attached to structures. Ross gets structures. It's a much a much larger scope than just putting structures in the stream. <coughs> Uh, floodplain reconnection. Uh, this is uh, a term that's become more and more popular. Um, this is my definition, reducing the degree, degree of channel incision in order to increase the frequency of flood flows accessing the functional floodplain. So basically, getting flows out into an active floodplain more often. That's what floodplains are supposed to do. They're supposed to uh, convey and treat flood flows. Um, floodplain restoration is a term we use at land studies quite a bit. Um, and really, it is floodplain reconnection. Usually, um, the nature of the, the work that we do, we are dealing a lot with legacy sediment and the reestablishment of buried uh, riparian wetlands. So, you can say floodplain reconnection, you can say floodplain restoration. Um, generally, there's an implication of legacy sediment um, with floodplain restoration. I don't know that that's entirely uh, cast in stone. Again, that's just my definition. And then regenerative stormwater conveyance, uh, Tom talked about uh, a little bit. Uh, to be quite honest, well, the Anne Arundel County, Maryland definition, which is where this got some legs, um, open channel conveyance structures that convert through attenuation ponds and sand seepage filter, subsurface storm flow to shallow, shallow groundwater flow. Um, I don't have a, a lot of firsthand experience with these. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about them today. Um, it is another tool. Um, been, been used, uh, like I said, more in Maryland, um, and uh, not a whole lot um, in Pennsylvania that, that I'm familiar with. But here's the here's the key point: stream bank stabilization, natural channel design, floodplain reconnection, floodplain restoration. They're not mutually exclusive; they overlap. Um, we often will, uh, you know, as part of the design process, we're going through. Uh, some of the, the, the geomorphic assessment uh, procedures. Um, I've been through Dave Roskin courses and we use that, that information extensively. Um, it's, it's good stuff, it's good, it's good information. Um, we're just doing more with the floodplain and so we're applying it a little bit differently. Uh, but they're not exclusive. 
there, there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, you'll see in some of the pictures there's some, some bank stabilization structures in some of our projects for various reasons. Sometimes it's an insurance policy where we just want to prevent uh, the possibility of erosion. In some cases it's just fish habitat because we wanted to throw, throw a little extra in. Um, but for whatever reason, all of this seems to be very polarizing. Um, and Tom's job is sort of shepherding the, uh, the expert panel uh, was, a, was a pretty challenging one, and there's a lot of, of very different and very strong viewpoints. Um, why that is, I, I don't quite know. Um, and, and I think that um, if we can, can all step back and kind of take a deep breath, uh, maybe we're not all as far apart as, as some would like to think. But, um, but to ultimately, to, to select the best tool for the job, what, what are we going to use? We need to understand um, some basic things about the project. Uh, we need to understand first what the project goals are. What are we trying to achieve? Is it nutrient sediment load reductions? Is it uh, flood hazard mitigation? Is it some other things? So we'll talk to you a little bit about that. We need to understand the project. How much money do we have and is there a way to get more? Um, we need to understand our site constraints and, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of those. Um, and finally, we, we need to understand the stream. And we need to be doing the right project in the right place, uh, given, given what the stream is telling us. So project goals, like I said, it could be nutrient sediment load reductions, could just be stabilization for the sake of, uh, of bank stabilization. Uh, we could be interested in habitat restoration, uh, aquatic or terrestrial. Um, a lot of people are interested in restoring trout fisheries. Um, flood attenuation and hazard mitigation uh, is a big one. And what, what happens when it floods and what problems is it causing now? Um, and how can we fix that? Um, you know, that's a public health and safety issue in terms of, of flooding issues. Um, golf courses have, have, have also recognized that uh, looking, looking at this can, can uh, reduce their maintenance costs and increase uh, or decrease the downtime um, for their, their courses. So we've done some work there um, because of that. Infrastructure protection, utilities, bridges, roads, um, and stormwater management. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specifically at the end about um, some stormwater management projects and how this uh, can tie together. Where's the money coming from? Is it out of the municipal budget to meet MS4 requirements? Is it grant funding? A lot of times stream restorations have been historically funded by grants. Um, is that the best way to do it? Um, we want to wait for the next round or the next grant? Um, or are there some other sources? Um, cost sharing programs, private funding? Can we create public private partnerships? Um, and how might that work? How can we stretch the budget by adding additional partners with additional goals? And can, we, can we kill multiple birds with one stone and in doing so increase uh, uh, the, the, the amount of work that we can get done? We need to understand site constraints. Who owns the property? What are their goals? Um, is it public or private? How much space do we have? Is it, is it a very confined system? Or do we have a little bit of space here or there that we can use? Um, do we have utilities and infrastructure? That's always one of the first things we have to look at because the sewer lines are running right down along the stream. So we have to make sure that we're not conflicting there. Um, existing crossings. And what, what kind of long-term maintenance considerations do we need? If it's on private property, what, is, what about access? And, um, who's going to maintain it? And how's that going to be done? And finally, we need to, we need to understand the stream. Because ultimately, we need the, the project design to work. And, and um, so we need to understand a lot of things about the system in order to, to design a project that's going to, that's going to last, be a long-term solution. Um, so the hydrologic re regime, how much water is getting there, how often, um, how big of a watershed are we dealing with. Um, this is you know, the Rockland site that I'll talk about. It's uh, just under three square miles, so it's a, not a real big watershed, um, big enough that, that we have to, to, uh, to, to consider what that means. Um, maybe it's a three, 30 square mile watershed. Um, and that has a whole, whole other level of considerations that we need to think about. Uh, what kind of land cover do we have? Is it forested? Is it agricultural? Is it sort of mixed uh, uh, use or is it highly urbanized? 
um, that's going to affect uh, significantly what kind of flows we're dealing with. Uh, what's the geology like? Uh, we deal with a lot of karst systems um, in Lancaster County. Uh, there's a little bit of karst out here. Um, you know, in, in other cases, we've got transitions from carbonate uh, or from uh, from shale formations to carbonate. What does that do? And how do we have to consider that? Are there structures upstream that, that may affect um, the, the flow or the sediment regime that's coming? Um, do we have a dam? Do you have one of these upstream? Um, that makes a big difference. And there could be a whole host of other influences that we need to, to consider in a, in a hydrologic analysis. What types of hydraulic conditions are going on? What is the, so the hydrology is How's the water getting to the site and how much water are we getting? The hydraulic conditions are what's the water doing when it's in the system and how does it, how does it interact? Do we have any structures downstream? Um, so you have crossings um, and not just is there a crossing and what size is the crossing, but what is the alignment of the crossing? So here you have a stream coming in from the side, you know, poorly aligned with the, uh, with the, the culvert, uh, the culvert poorly aligned with the stream. Um, so what does that do, and how do we need to take that into account? Um, you can see there's quite a bit of deposition here um, that, that's occurred because it's an inefficient crossing. And what does that mean? Uh, are, there, are there floodplain encroachments? We like to build things right up to the right up within the floodplain, um, and and we like to protect then the, the property that's behind that. So what is what are those uh, encroachments doing? We have channel incision. Um, this is what happens when you yank a dam and don't consider the sediment that's behind it. Um, this is this is very shortly after dam removal, and uh, we got an instant two and a half feet of vertical incision uh, because because pulling a dam is a good thing all the time, right? Um, so moving dams is good as long as we're careful about what's going on with the sediment. Are there plant form problems? Uh, are, there, are there hard meanders? Are there other things horizontally going on with the channel? Um, you have a situation like this where um, you've got this hard meander pounding on this bank. You can see uh, subsidence here with the channel, the, the banks just falling in. Um, a little bit later the same day after it rained a little bit, that channel that came up. This is the same, same place. So you can see the, the flow pounding on this bank. You can also see it trying to shortcut across here. So what do you do with that? Um, and, and how do we consider that? I'll give you a, I'll give you a clue. Here's, here's the, the finished product. Um, we took a little bit of the bend out of that meander, uh, but more importantly, we, we cut down uh, the floodplain so the high flows can go over the top. And we're reducing uh, the, the shear stress in the channel and the stress on that bend. Uh, and that's what it looks like in August after it's uh, fully vegetated. You have debris jams. Uh, we've all seen debris jams that are causing problems with scour. Um, sometimes debris can be a good thing in the channel. If it's in the wrong place or in, or in the wrong orientation, it can be a problem. So um, what, what do we have to deal with in terms of that? And are there other influences? What's your sediment regime? Are you dealing with stuff that's silt size or basketball size or Volkswagen size? Um, and that drives a lot of our design considerations. Um, you have fine material like this. Uh, here's sort of a mixed bag with, with some, some bigger material. Um, sometimes it's, you know, uh, like I said, Volkswagen size landed in people's backyards. So, What are the sources of that sediment? Uh, a lot of times, like we said, it's coming from stream banks. And it could be fine material uh, coming from a stream bank like this. Um, it could be coarser material uh, that coming from a bank like this, and you know, is it is it coming from from the banks, or is there some other source? And then, how how, how are we transporting that sediment, um, and what's being mobilized? Uh, we talk about shear stress. Uh, basically, what shear stress is is the 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 force resisting the flow of the water. So if you put your hand down on the table and you press very lightly, it's easy to move your hand. If you press really hard and try to move it, you feel that resistance. That's effectively uh, what shear stress is. And so uh, 
at a fundamental level, it's, it's a function of, of depth and slope. So the steeper your stream and the more depth of flow you have, the higher your shear stress. Um, and this just gives you a little illustration at a 1% one, 1 slope. So um, there's a little slope to it, but not, not a terribly st steep system. Uh, you're moving golf ball size stuff at under a foot, and you're moving baseball size stuff at about a foot. Um, and at about three feet, you move the basketball size stuff. Um, the stream out here, um, I took a look, and there's, there's two foot plus boulders that are rolling around out there. Uh, because as that flow comes up, you get a lot of shear stress. And so we have to understand what size material are we moving. And what size material do we want to move? And then based on that, is it a grading or degrading? Is it cutting down or is it filling up? Uh, and you see both of those cases. And, and we have to understand why the, that aggradation and degradation is occurring. And this one often gets forgotten, but we need to think about our base level control. What's, what's holding the stream bed? Is there, is there a bedrock underneath it that's keeping it from cutting farther? Um, sometimes closed bottom culverts can be uh, good grade control, uh, or there may be utility lines that are protected. Or on the other hand, you may have head cuts uh, that, are, that are forming that you have to consider. So if you have something like this downstream of your project, then you might want to consider what's going on and you might want to consider the, the threat to that sewer line. Uh, so, uh, and these types of things happen, we need to consider uh, what that means in terms of the long-term project. We also need to understand historical influences, and this can tell us uh, quite a bit. We, we do a lot of research on and historical mapping um, on our projects to, to see how, how things got to be the way they are, and that can tell quite a story. Um, Tom talked a little bit about legacy sediment and the effect of mill ponds. Um, so I'll just, just to review that, um, mills powered everything in the, the 1800s, late 1700s, or even in the early 20th century. Um, there was a lot of mill ponds. Some of them were big industrial hammer mills, grist mills, uh, you name it, there was milk for it um, because that's what the power source was. And a lot of those are documented and a lot of them aren't. Some of them are smaller you know, farm operations where, where we see them that, that aren't on the old maps. Uh, but at the same time, as Tom also mentioned, uh, there was a lot of land clearing, uh, timber harvesting, um, agricultural practices with no conservation district to guide them, um, and so you had a lot of erosion, and so these mill ponds became fairly effective sediment traps. And over time, as those uh, dams, those mills became obsolete, the dams breached, and now your stream system is riding on top of very fine material um, that really can't handle the shear stress of that system, and so it starts to cut down through those sediments. And um, it's just a map showing density of, of mills per county in 1840. Just a snapshot of 1840, what was um, what was on record, at least. This doesn't, again, show all of them. Uh, you know, we're from Lancaster County. There's quite a bit in Lancaster, Chester, York County. Um, I was in Indiana County there, there in the red uh, a month or so ago. Um, Blair County is not quite uh, as red. It's a little bit yellower, but there's still some, some mill dams there. And you can see just in the whole, the whole northeast, um, those dams were prevalent. And we got pretty efficient at putting them in, too, one right after the other. So the tail order of one extended all the way up to the, the dam of the next one. And so it's, it's sort of a continuous influence up these, uh, these valleys. And they show up everywhere, in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Um, this is actually in the upper Delaware watershed. There's a, an old mill dam. So. And what it does obviously creates unstable stream banks and uh, streams that are detached from the floodplain. Um, and and you, get, you get situations like this. I think Kelly showed this, this photo before. Um, this poor tree is not gonna, gonna be able to sustain that bank when it, when it starts cutting over there. Uh, but this is, this is sort of a telltale uh, legacy sediment. It's uniform, fine grain material. Um, you tend, tend to see this darker, uh, dense clay lens at the bottom. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll find organic material, logs, at least a leaf pack. Um, uh, they've actually been able to, to pull seed samples out and identify um, uh, wetland species that were, were growing there uh, before the dams were in place. But this is, this is the kind of thing we typically see. Um, 
The other thing that happens is ditching and straightening. Um, you don't need to see a picture, you just need to see uh, the USGS map for this. This is um, an 1864 map. Uh, map. Um, this red outlined area is, is the project site. And you can see the alignment in 1864, the Santa Domingo Creek, and the alignment in when the USGS map was created. And that is not a natural alignment. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was channelized for agricultural purposes. And you also see that there's a tribute what is mapped as the main stem of the Santa Domingo, extending out to the west here, it doesn't show up at all. Um, there was probably no stream there historically. Um, it's a carbonate area. Um, it's about a, a 1.2 square mile drainage area here. And the only, the only stream is really a ditch between the, the fields that's dry unless it's raining. Um, so, uh, but it was channelized um, and, and so, that historic manipulation is, is something that you see quite frequently. Um, road construction, uh, this, this has a big effect in, in narrow valleys. You've probably seen something like this. And what's happening is the road's taking up half of that valley width. And so now your, your channel all of a sudden became very incised and the shear stress went up. And so a lot of sediment that was, was stable uh, before now is getting mobilized because, because the depth has increased and your shear stress has increased and that sediment now is moving downstream and it's dumping out somewhere, and it's going to have an effect downstream. Um, so, uh, typical situation, um, and uh, creates some, some challenging issues to deal with. Um, and I just I just labeled this urban fill. This is this is in Wrightsville. Uh, this is typical uh, buildings built right up to the edge of the stream. It was probably filled here so that they could build this here, um, make maximum use of that urban space. But then you get situations like this, <laughs> where it's extremely unstable. So, um, again, challenging situations to deal with uh, because this is urban infrastructure that's, that's already in place. Um, this is a local photograph. I don't know where it's from. Um, it's, it appears to be stable, uh, maybe even be grading a little bit. Um, but uh, there's it's, it's a little more than a storm pipe, really. Um, it's conveying that flow downstream somewhere. Uh, is, that, is that familiar? Anyone know where that is? Yeah. 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 And it's there. It's not a. Yeah. Uh, that's actually being worked on this next year. <clears throat> yeah, the walls are broken. Okay. okay. Here's another one locally. I don't know if anyone recognizes that one. Um, this isn't quite as urban, uh, but there's you know, buildings built and the streams running right around that behind there. So, um, at some point, I would think that that garage may be in jeopardy. But um, this, the, the tendency is to make make the maximum use of the land that we have, um, sometimes without regard for uh, consequences that that may create. And of course, forest clearing uh, is another thing to, to important factor to understand historically and how that may have influenced um, the channels that we're looking at and, and erosion that may have taken place um, years ago and now appears to be restabilized but it's, but it's reconfigured uh, the way the streams look. So all of these factors um, are, are important to understand um, which, of the, which of them is to blame, which of them is most important and it's just like how do we do stream restoration uh, Tom was talking about bar fights for, for discussing, discussing that. Just discussing what's causing instability um, is, is equally polarizing. Um, and, you know, people say, well, it's, you know, the urban, urbanization is creating more runoff, and so that's, that's uh, pounding on the stream systems, and that's probably partially true. Uh, some people say it's the cows in the streams and agricultural areas, and they're certainly not helping. Um, legacy sediment certainly has a lot to do with it, but the reality is it's, it's some combination of, of factors probably. Um, in certain cases, one may be more, um, more important than another, uh, but there's, there's usually more than one thing going on that we need to understand in terms of, of identifying proper design tools to, to remedy the situation. And speaking of design tools, we realized that, uh, as I said, this whole region here is kind of 20, 30 years behind Lancaster County. I mean, to the effect that the township I now live in doesn't even have zoning in. 
Just imagine <laughs> that. Just, just imagine, you know. So, I mean, and they, they're proud of it. It's great because as long as you have some uh, political uh, ties, you can control what happens around you. But there is no zone. There are some municipalities are getting saldos, you know, subdivision land development ordinances. So if you subdivide, then we've got it. But it, until then, there's no zoning. It's a long story. I think you know a lot of the uh, the folks that don't want zoning or the township officials that you know have the luxury of doing what they want to do where they want to do. I think that's common too. But um, that's where we're at. We don't have you know regulation like other more sophisticated municipalities are. It's in some ways it's good, in other ways it's bad. But like that little shed you showed, you know, in the obviously in the original stream bank. Yeah, that probably happened overnight, or it was a wink, wink, nod, nod, approval from the township. He was related to, to the right people. It happens all the time here, and it just blows my mind. You know, it, it's. <laughs> well, it's especially since I think that swimmer's running is probably an anesthetist. <laughs> so, but it's just this is common, and this is. You're right. It is. It's bigger than just. There's a many. Of, there's a multiplicity of challenges. So. Thanks for bringing that up. A cover, a little bit about permitting, um, just to hit the highlights. Um, this this can get um, a little bit complex. I'll try to keep it simple, but if there's specific questions, feel free to throw them out there. Um, the state authorization for for stream restoration comes under Pennsylvania Code 25 PA Code Chapter 105. So Chapter 105 permits, um, and and that's the Dam Safety and Encroachment Act. Um, so, we're talking about water obstruction and encroachment permits. That's the, the general terminology. So the easiest one is the general permit, GP3, for stream bank stabilization and gravel bar removal. So that will cover bank stabilization, some limited uh, grading, depending on who's, who's administering it, if different conservation districts exercise a little bit more or less leniency, depending on where you are. Um, in, in some uh, in some counties, the they don't have the delegation agreement, and so it goes to DEP. I mean, do you guys have the delegation agreement to do 105 permitting here? Does that go straight to DEP? Because of the regional office. All right. Um, limitation there is 500 feet of, of stream bank and no wetland impacts. Um, $250 fee, um, and they're usually pretty quick and easy. Although it's going to depend on who's reviewing it, so it might be 30 to 60 days. You might get a quicker turnaround. You might, you might take longer, depending on how long you're, you're laughing. So I'm, I'm guessing that the regional office takes a little while. <laughs> We've experienced that too. Um, so, but that'll cover that'll cover a fairly simple project, small scale project. Um, sort of the next step up is the, the waiver 16. Uh, in in 10512A, there's a whole list of waivers. Um, and waiver 16 is for restoration activities. And this was one that was very little used for a long time. Um, it, it, it does cover restoration projects as long as the, the regional office, whoever's reviewing it, agrees that it's a restoration project. And then you just have to do an environmental assessment and some of the paperwork, you don't have to do an alternatives analysis, you don't have to do um, some of the other uh, paperwork that's required for a for a full joint permit. Um, legacy sediment projects have specific program guidance that um, they, if it's a legacy sediment project, it qualifies under white waiver 16, and the technical review will actually go to the EP central office. Um, so that's a little bit different, and they have been moving those through in the order of six months now. So um, that's a significantly improved from the two year turnarounds that we've been getting prior to that. Um, So that's the waiver 16. You can also use that for, for something that's a little bit bigger that might qualify for a GP3, uh, but it's a little over the 500. Depending on, again, it's going to depend on the regional office. Um, you might be able to use it for a uh, something that's just a little bit more than the GP3 is going to cover. And then you get into your, your full water uh, obstruction and encouragement permit, joint permit, um, and that covers. Um, anything that isn't covered by uh, the waiver 16 or uh, the GP3. There's a couple other waivers in certain circumstances that may also apply, but I don't want to get too much into the weeds there. Um, 
These will typically take a little bit longer. Uh, they do have a permit decision guarantee. Um, it's not worth the paper it's printed on, in my opinion. Hopefully there's nobody from DEP here, but um, we haven't had much success with, with uh, that permit decision guarantee actually speeding things up. So um, it, it's a more extensive process. It requires more paperwork, more, uh, more documentation. On the federal level, um, it's a 404 permit, and Tom did, did mention this. Um, there's also a 401 water quality certification that the state issues, but um, typically a, a stream restoration project will be covered uh, one of two ways by the Corps. Um, and again, this is going to depend on the core district that you're in. Um, the Philly core district, um, which is going to handle the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, if there's less than an acre of impact, uh, we've been using the PASP GP4, um, and that's that's basically like a general permit. Now, sometimes, depending on what it is, uh, there'll be a more involvement or less involvement um, from the core. But generally, that's a fairly simple process. If there's more than an acre of, of impact to waters or wetlands, um, you can use the Nationwide 27. This is this is like a standing general permit as well, as long as you. As long as you follow the criteria, Nationwide 27 is, is specifically for restoration activities. Um, so one of those two, two permits has usually gotten us through on the, on the federal side. And then there's local approvals depending on you know, municipal ordinances. Um, you have to think about Chapter 106 compliance which deals with floodplain issues. Um, if it's a, a non-municipal project, the municipality um, is, is in, in their um, jurisdiction. If it's a municipal project, then that, that 106 or floodplain uh, compliance review would go to DEP. Uh, and there may be earth disturbance permits or other local permits, so uh, whatever the, the municipality has. So some project examples, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cover the full range. I will put a disclaimer on it. We we do a lot of floodplain restoration work, and so. I'll probably have a disproportionate number of slides for that, but I do have some, some bank stabilization work and, and some other projects. Some of them land studies projects and some of them not. Some of them good projects and some of them not uh, in both cases. So um, this, is, this is the you know, basic uh, throw a rock at it. And if it's a big system, throw a bigger rock at it. Um, and I guess if you throw a big enough rock at it, it'll work. Um, it's not pretty, it's kind of sterile, uh, but got the job done here. Um, it's not something that we would necessarily advocate, but um, in certain cases it can work. Um, this is a cross vein on, actually a series of cross veins on the Little Conestoga Creek, uh, Conestoga Country Club. Now these are tricky because you have, to, you have to consider the system you're in and you have to know what you want it to do. In this case, these cross veins are really just habitat structures. What they're doing is creating a pool, a deeper pool here, because there's no riffle pool sequence in this in this reach. It's just a long, flat water. It's a really flat slope. And so, in theory, a cross vein will, will pull flow away from the, the banks and protect the banks and create a deeper scour hole in the middle. Um, it's probably doing some of that. Like I said, more than that, it's, it's creating some, some very wild that in that reach. So, they're, they're installed well, um, and they're not designed or installed by land studies. Um, they were designed by RITU and installed by Flyway Excavating. Um, um, we work with Flyway, they do a nice job of installing these things. Um, but they're working fine. Uh, this is an uncharacteristically stable reach of the Little Conestoga. You'll see another picture on, on the west branch of the Little Conestoga that it looks dramatically different than this. Uh, but the banks aren't really high here. So your shear, and it's fairly flat, so your shear stresses are low. So your margin for, for error is higher. Um, but these can work in the right application. There's some cross veins right out here um, that are experiencing a little bit more stress and they're not pulling up quite as well as, as these. Um, this is just upstream, also on the Little Conestoga, uh, a project that we got called into uh, by the Lancaster Area Sewer Authority. Uh, the green right here is the sewer line. So there's an imminent problem. 
what you can't see, you'll see first from in some other pictures, is that the stream's coming in from this side and pounding on that bank and then making a hard bend. And then there's secondary recirculation, so you see that backwards swirling over here that's scouring out another another section. And this tree is just barely hanging on. Uh, under this pile of debris is just roots. So there's really no soil there. So, um, so we were brought in to address this primarily to stabilize the bank. Uh, we did move the sewer line back a little bit. Um, and so keep an eye on this branch and this tree. And the next slide is the, is the stabilized condition. Um, so there's that overhanging branch. And the tree is behind here. Uh, so it's a little bit different angle. But what we did was a, a modified tow wood structure. Uh, tow wood something that Dave Roskin uh, sort of developed. And we've, we've been using it on a number of projects in, in different variations. Um, uh, but basically, in this case, what it amounted to was a log mat uh, that extended it back into the bank as far as we could. Um, and, and so that log mat, on top of it, is, is, a, a, wrap, is, is a layer of soil wrapped in, in uh, uh, heavy-duty matting. And then we come back up at a 3 to 1 slope. So there's, there's about a 10-foot run out here on a flat bench before you hit that, that slope. And what that does is it reduces the energy of this, this flow coming around the bank here so that when it does hit the bank it's moving slower and it's going to protect that. Um, it also creates some habitat. Um, typically there's void spaces under those logs that, that are, uh, create some, some hiding places for fish. Um, it's, a, it's a much uh, more natural solution than throwing a bunch of rock on it. Um, and, and they typically hold up pretty well. The wood, as long as it's saturated, will not rot. Um, so as long as you set that um, low, um, we're on bedrock here, so we're a little bit higher than we would have liked to be. But typically, you want those logs to be uh, completely submerged. Uh, as long as they stay saturated, they'll last indefinitely. Um, this is a little closer up picture of that same spot. Uh, you can see the ends of the logs sticking out and then the fabric uh, holding that soil in place. And this was done late last fall, so this is just getting started as far as vegetative establishment. A lot of what you're seeing here is just a just cover crop. And which direction are the logs laying there? Into the bank. Into it. So it flows perpendicular. Coming, yeah, they're perpendicular to the, to the flow. Um, this is, so this is that area that we were looking at before. This is this lower uh, secondary recirculation. So the flow comes around the bend, and then you get this, this recirculation here that starts to scour out here. Um, and then that's the finished condition there. So um, here's this tree, and the, the toe wood actually comes out to here. There's the tree. So, and that's, you know, on a, in this, the sewer authority was interested in doing something a little bit different. You know, on a golf course, this looks a whole lot nicer than a big pile of rock in your stream bank. Um, and it, it, it creates, again, it creates some aquatic habitat. Um, it's a terrestrial habitat here. So, um, this is uh, one that we worked on in a, 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 a homeowners association community, um, and unfortunately, this is one of those where no matter how many pictures you take, you never find the one you want afterwards. So I apologize. The, the, the last picture of the completed project, you'll see that there's a. Well, you can kind of see the roadway up here. Um, you don't get a sense for the fact that this was falling vertically down from the edge of the roadway and it was imminently going to undermine the roadway. These stakes are from a uh, Christmas tree where that, that, that someone had installed, trying to stabilize it, and um, it could only really do so much, and, and they all washed away. So all that was left was some cables and stakes. <coughs> um, so it was a little bit rainy when we did the work, but this is also a modified tow wood structure. Um, and this one goes a little bit higher because we had to get up, up to the roadway. So it's layers of, of logs and, and brush and uh, sandwiched between soil lifts of, of soil wrapped in um, heavy duty uh, matting. And that's the finished product a little bit later. Now the important thing here is that just as important as stabilizing this bank was cutting this, this bench down on this side. Because the, the channel was incised to the point that all the flow was coming in and banging on this bank. And if we hadn't done anything over there, we, we hadn't, wouldn't have addressed the shear stress issue. So by cutting this bank down on, on the other side, 
to, it's about four to six inches above the water surface. That allows those high flows to come up and, and flow here rather than being forced into the bank. So <coughs> part of the solution was, was stabilizing the bank and building this back up. And a, an equally important part of it was just cutting down the other side so that there wasn't as much stress on that bank. Um, here's some examples of ones that didn't fly so well. We installed these uh, a little bit begrudgingly um, because they, it wasn't fully thought out maybe. Um, so this is a log deflector which was it's intended to, to um, push the water back to the center and if you have a series of them you can sort of help the water go around the bend. Um, obviously it didn't quite make it. Um, this one is it just isn't able to do all the work that needs to be done here. Um, and so we need, to, we need to consider all the variables and how much work we can expect out of, out of some of these structures. Oops. Um, this, is looking, this is the same structure looking upstream at it. Uh, again, that poor tree is not going to make it probably. Um, so uh, same, same project, um, it's just, just overwhelmed with that the, the hard structures, what these things do is, is they, they help the, the flow to go where we want it to. Um, but you can all, only do so much with, with fighting the system. Um, and so what we try to do is address the shear stress, reduce the shear stress more than force the flow in, to do what we want it to do. Um, and we find that that works a whole lot better when you create a situation that's a lower stress, lower energy system rather than trying to contain that high energy, high stress system. Um, here's an example of, of some log deflectors that actually are doing a nice job and they were installed by a group of, of students at the Lancaster County Youth Conservation School. This is on the uh, Seglock run. Uh, the Fish Commission has, has um, laid out a multi-year plan uh, so the, the students at the school can come in. They, it's a week over the summer they, and one day they spend uh, doing this kind of work um, and so there's a there's a, a plan laid out through this reach um, the fish commission is there to supervise there's some uh, some volunteer um, actually flyway excavating volunteers equipment and the students put the structures in um, so this is one right after they did it um, here's one um, and that's the same one and another one downstream and and circumstances are that these types of structures are holding up pretty well in this stream. So you can get, you know, they're, they're creating um, some habitat, they're doing, they're stabilizing the stream bank to a certain extent. Um, like I said, they can only do so much, but um, they're in, they're stable, um, they're doing what they're intended to do. So you can put them in with some cheap labor. So we're going to get into a, a little bit more intensive approach. Um, I'm just going to generically call it bank grading. Um, it's not quite floodplain restoration or reconnection, but it's a little bit more than just uh, structures. Um, and this is on a little tributary to the Conestoga River. Um, I didn't know it was called Bowman Run until I pulled up the map. Um, this is not a land studies project. I'm not actually sure who did it. Um, but this reach is the reach that was, was worked on. And it's your typical reach through a pasture, beat up by cattle. Um, it's in size about four feet. Um, banks are falling apart. Pretty much typical condition that you, you would see in a in a pasture, a degraded pasture situation. And that's what they did with it. Um, they gave up a little bit of pasture land, um, fenced the cattle out, have a crossing, a stabilized crossing. They didn't really do anything with the stream itself, but they graded a, a reasonable slope back. Um, so what would have been here before was a, a vertical bank and then straight over to the pasture and they, they took that out. Um, just doing that reduces that shear stress quite a bit. So the, the channel's stable. Um, they've got some trees planted in here. Um, really a nice nice project, probably not very expensive. Again, I don't know for sure. Um, but uh, it's, it's doing the job. It's, it's not as wide a <coughs> as some people would like to see, but it's certainly a whole lot better than what was there before. Uh, yeah. That project. Do you think maybe they would they, they maybe commit this to a conservation easement maybe and get like is would could it be a crap project or something? I, I'm pretty sure this one wasn't crap. Um, okay. I've, I've asked around a little bit and, and I, I haven't 
got a, a good answer on, on who did it. I, I think the landowner may have just, just did it. I don't know what kind of assistance he may have had on that. But yeah, it, it could be, it, it could have fallen into to certainly some crap or some other cautionary program. We're just trying to talk a little bit about what kind of incentive programs could we give, you know, because here at Blair County, you know, all, all across PA, farmers are using every square inch to distribute their, their nutrient loading to the point where they're running farms in other areas just to distribute their manure, you know. So what can we do to make this happen here where it's some benefit to the, to the farmer? Whereas instead of giving up something, he's gaining something. Well, that's where we have to be. You know, it could be a partnership with someone who needs the, the load reduction. So you calculate the load reduction from this project. Um, you know, if the municipality needs it for for their for CBPRP or DMDL plan, um, there could be some financial arrangement there potentially. Um, um, this is another one on uh, Little Cacalico Creek. Um, the, the Calcutt Creek Watershed Association did this one through a grant. Um, here's a cross vein that's working. Um, it's installed correctly. The, the arm, main arm goes up to the top of the bank. Um, this, is a, this is at the upstream transition, which is always a tricky spot in these kind of projects. How do you transition in and out? Um, and so sometimes a cross vein is a good way to do that. Um, this one is done, done pretty well. Um, they, use, they use a good number of structures in this. This is a log. Uh, log vein, and then these are mud sills uh, around the outside of the bend. So that that allows for an undercut bank around the outside of your um, your bend. So it's it's armoring the toe of your slope with these logs, and it's creating um, habitat underneath that allows for an undercut bank. Um, so again, this is this is mostly just some bank grading with some structures, um, and it it was a it's a pretty good project. This was just done last fall as well. Again, the structures are appropriate for um, the, the conditions, the, the shear stresses that are there and the, the hydraulic regime that, that we have to deal with. So, um, here's, a, here's a case of a, um, a habitat structure that was done as part of a, um, so, so the owner here got in a little bit of trouble with DEP and we got called in to, to be the moderator. Um, and uh, so they wanted, as part of the consent decree, um, they wanted some habitat structures. And so we said, well, all right, we'll give you habitat structures, but there's a lot of sed sediment, big sediment movement here, and uh, there's really not a good setup to do the type of structures that they wanted. So we kind of got backed into a corner and we had to put them in. Um, this is a, a mud sill, kind of like what was in the, uh, the other project here. Um, and so so there's, there's log footers here that, that creates a, an undercut condition and there's another log behind this. Um, so there is some depth to that. And the idea is that it gives some, some fish cover, place to hide. And when we installed it, it was working pretty well. Um, and, and actually it's, it's still there, it's still stable, but the sediment has sort of moved in and, and, and kind of filled it. So it's, there's no harm here, it's still stable, uh, but it's not performing the intended function. So sometimes if you want to do a habitat structure, just because someone said you had to, uh, it doesn't always work in the system that you have to work with. So, all right, I'm going to go into um, some floodplain restoration project examples. Um, it's about it's about four rows. So, what do I got? About half an hour yet, or so? As much time as you want. Okay, I'm, I might fly through some of these. Um, and then I'll get to some of the stormwater projects. So I might skip over some here in the middle. Um, again, this is just talking about um, floodplain restoration uh, on a legacy sediment site. You've seen that slide before. Uh, here's just a rendering of, of what's going on. We have a lot of times these trees that are up, perched up high and disconnected from the groundwater. Um, you know, you'll see this buried material under here. Sometimes these channels are incising down through the old stream bed elevation because uh, they've been channelized. Um, here's a, on the west branch of the Little Conestoga. Uh, so you've got about 17, 18 feet of legacy sediment. They actually have record that they built dams and then they filled, the, the ponds built, filled in and they built a dam on top of the dam. Um, and, and so you get some of these cases where you have 
a significant accumulation of, of sediment. Um, down here at the bottom, there's they actually carbon dated them. There's a leaf mat with chestnut, white oak, red oak, and sycamore. And, and those leaves, you can actually pull, pull out the chunk of leaf mat and pull apart the leaves because they've been saturated and, and are preserved. Um, and then below that, you get the, this PD clay material that would have been the old uh, floodplain wetland. Um, and so this is what we're shooting for. Um, in an ideal world, we'd restore it to what it was. In some cases, we have to make some modifications to that, depending on site constraints and budgets and um, other things. So, uh, but we're looking to, to reattach that system to, to the groundwater, attach the stream to the floodplain, um, and, and create uh, a system more like what might have been here um, before European settlers arrived. And so, just visually, what the design approach is here's Santa Domingo Creek, uh, New Street Park. Um, you can see the channel incision. This, this channel is a straight shot. Um, you'll see uh, on, a, on a concept plan, the stream was just as straight as an arrow through the park. Um, and the restored condition, uh, we cut that, removed the legacy sediment, so we're cutting all that out. And we have a much smaller um, channel that's, that's, it doesn't take much for this to flood. Um, and that's, that's the idea, we're gonna use that floodplain do what it's intended to, to do. And so we're going from a system that's a high energy system, um, highly erosive, undercutting you know, big trees, even can't hold this bank when it gets undercut. Um, so you know, our systems like that, and we're converting it to a low energy system that when it floods, you have low shear stresses, low energy, um, and, and they're just inherently more stable. Um, so we don't have to rely on hard arm rain or a lot of structures because the geometry of the system is inherently stable. Um, here's another example. This is Lance Holmes. Um, and that's actually Landis Holmes during the, we had a pretty good snow melt this spring. Uh, it got warm all of a sudden, gave a little bit of rain, and that's that's what we got. And that's what that's what we want. We want that, that uh, floodplain to be working. You can see uh, that the channel kind of runs up through here, but I have to imagine that's probably relieving somebody downstream of you know, flood problems, right? I mean, yeah, so, and I'll get into a little bit later how we can quantify that there's actually um, peak rate reduction that occurs because of that. Um, and, and so it can have implications in terms of stormwater management, or it can have implications as far as flood hazard mitigation downstream. Uh, this is Shover's Run at Bedford Springs Resort, just down the road here. Um, not too far, and you can see the before and after photos there. Like I said, golf courses were, were quick to figure out that um, this type of approach um, lowered local flood stages. So for a given storm event, you know, the flood stage might have been up here before and now it's down here, which means the fairways are drier. And they don't have debris on their fairways and they, don't, they can open them sooner after a storm. Um, and it's less maintenance. That's Shover's Run. Another shot of that. I think that's the last one, Shover's Run. Um, this is Linnet's Run, um, right down the road from our office. The, the channel had been pinned against the valley wall, so this is a legacy sediment project and, and a little bit of historic manipulation to get that stream out of the way so we can, we can use this space uh, for, for pasture, for, for crops. And so the, the new channel comes back to the center of the valley. You can see, so this is, this is on the tail end of construction. This is that old channel that was pinned against the valley wall, uh, kind of like you see in the rendering. And then this is the restored condition. The other thing that cool that happened here, I mentioned about um, the buried seed bank um, from the old wetland floodplains. We had a lot of volunteer um, species come in that we didn't plant. Um, that, that old seed bank was still viable, and those seeds, when they were exposed, germinated and grew. Um, and again, it floods, and it doesn't take a whole lot to get it up and out of the bank. Now, Talking about that, 
this is this is um, getting that out of that bank flow and, and where we're setting that floodplain is highly dependent upon the sediment regime that you have to deal with. These systems don't have the, the, their sediment load is almost entirely silts and clays. So we can we can set a very low floodplain elevation because we don't have to convey big material through it. Um, in a in a freestone system, then then you have to reconsider that a little bit. You've got bigger material that you have to move, um, and that that affects uh, what that channel geometry is going to look like. More shot of Banta. This is uh, San Domingo Creek at New Street Park. This is the one I said is sort of straight as an arrow through here. Um, what it looked like beforehand. That's during construction. Uh, we try to work, construct the channels in the dry outside of the existing channel as much as we can and then, and then connect it um, back in. Use side mats to, to establish that channel in this case. Um, we've, had, we've had success with using side mats. Um, you can come back in and kill that grass off and then plant into that, um, the, the floodplain species. Um, so depending on the site and the availability of material, that's one, one tool we we'll use. And that's flooding. We can, can sit up my window and watch it when it rains and watch that flood come up. It's pretty cool. Question? Uh, a project of that scale, what, what, would it, what did it run price-wise? Do you know roughly? This one was 2004. Um, I don't, Kelly, do you know what the budget was for, for this? How much? Yeah. Construction? I, I, I can tell you, Landis Homes was, um, was 5.7 acres of wetland, so you know, the whole project footprint was just over six acres, um, almost 3,000 feet of stream, and that one was 785,000, give or take, uh, for design permit construction. Um, Brock Lidditz that I'll show you is about, is an approximate number, but about a million uh, design permitting construction. That was uh, 30, 3,300 feet of stream and 17 acres. So that's a much, uh, much larger footprint. So these projects are incredibly reasonable for what, what you get out of the... In, in terms of, of cost per pound of, of sediment removed, yeah, compared to the only thing that has them beat is ag practices. You, you, can't, you can't beat field practices for, for uh, load reduction value, but uh, this would be next to it. I, I would agree that bang for your buck, these are very useful programs. Even mine, that buck, doesn't go as far up here as it does. Like, what's happening with the plant structure? So you're basically, your project down there would have used up Anna's Townships. Higher budget. Reason, I mean, you know, seventy-five percent. So, you know, so yes, it's cost-effective because I think it does pull a lot of stuff out of the stream. But a million-dollar project or pretty close to a million-dollar project is way outside the reach of almost every municipality out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the benefit there too, just knowing Lancaster County, is that the, the, the developer again probably got some benefit from doing the right thing. Well, well the homes. Got the yeah, yeah, homes. yeah. And, and, uh, and I'll talk about that. That doesn't so. happen here. We don't have development like that. So, mixed blessing, you know, we have to worry about to begin with, but by the back side, no one's pulling that money in. So. Yeah, and that's that's a matter, I mean, it's it's a good point. It's part of the reason that we need, we need multiple tools, and maybe all you need to do is 10 rain gardens and, and you're done, or, or whatever it may be. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, speaking of this in stream bank, that theme that we're on today, you know, certainly riparian repair, because we have tons of agricultural area in the, in the town. We have, you know, eroded banks like that. So riparian repair, if you can get something like that done and pick up riparian easements, and yeah, you're looking at huge bang through by. But once again, you know, putting trees in brush uh, in 25 foot buffer strip is going to be a different order of magnitude than changing channels around and all this other kind of stuff, which, you know, just keep in mind how so there's a lot of nice tools in that toolbox. A lot of these, and we can probably afford some of them up here. We cannot afford to get the brand new Peter Girl Press. That's not going to work. Or can, can multiple, you know, can, can there be multiple funding sources where it may be a little bit from here, a little bit from 10 municipalities or whatever it is, and a little bit from somewhere else, a developer or a grant or something. So this, this project is actually funded by That's what we're balancing is what those 
benefits are. And, um, you know, Ben's going to be talking about the latest on this project, which is some of our projects. Right, and well, once again, I think these are good projects, and I agree with what you're saying, it's good bang for your buck, but something like this would be something with definitely have a, a once in a lifetime funding or a third party, they want a public private partnership. It, but that, this is a, this is like a Cadillac, you know, in the land of, you know, the theory. You know, Penn I don't know what the is dependent upon the dependent regional or district office, but PennDOT could be another potential partner. We're uh, in Anaheim Borough. Um, it's it's a much sim more simplistic project, but um, it affects. There's two bridges back to back that, that have flooding issues, and so they have interest in removing sediment from the corridor. You know, so so they're contributing basically all the excavation. You know, there's. It's going to be different. Everybody's got a different situation. It's a matter of trying to fit the pieces together. So. There's another uh, same best who's also working a lot with the ATL right now and park projects and municipal projects and working with municipalities that, that don't have the budgets to offset with their That's a good point too. Uh, coming back to, from outside the area, in, back into this area, one of the things that's shocking to me is that we're, uh, my roots are here, so I can say this, but we're, we're back into this, uh, lack of a better term, we're in the, in the right wing, democratic, conservative, you know, we're, we don't want to spend tax money. It's wrong to tax, first of all, then it's, it's even worse to try to get that tax money and spend it. Or borrow. Yeah, so that's wrong. Well, guess what? You know, we're all paying taxes, whether it's high or low. And if we don't get it back in our communities here, Philly and Pittsburgh are more than happy to spend our tax money in their parks, or their schools, or their communities. So we need to be smarter about how we can get these grants and compile <coughs> them or tag team them and work with PennDOT and DCNR to get our tax money back and not feel guilty for spending it. So that's. That's another thing we have to work on as communities, as a region. It's okay to get our tax money back. So, well, I see. I see. Yeah, so I'm not saying anything, but some guy we're having in Philadelphia. You yeah, know, so. Pulling a hole, one of the trunks in there. And, so. and New York's the same way. Their, their Philadelphia is New York City, so it's, it, it, it's happening all around us. It's just those are the dynamics of what we're dealing with on a heightened level here. This is one more uh, set of pictures on, on Santa Domingo Creek at New Street. This is actually a, about the peak of a 10-year event. And this is just downstream of the project site. Um, you can see there's still a good bit of freeboard here, um, which is good because these people don't want to be flooded out. But I mean, basically, this is, this is little more than that, um, that picture we saw of the, of the channel through the street. Um, you know, it doesn't have the rock walls on it. But it's really not doing much more than that. Um, this is upstream where those flows are spread out at the same time. This is the same, as quick as I could walk from here to here, which is about um, maybe 100 yards. Um, and this is, this is all spread out. The velocity is lower. The energy is lower. Um, there's filtration going on. Um, you're accessing that, that broad floodplain. So you can see a dramatic, a dramatic difference from one spot to another. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears now into to stormwater management, and this and this is goes to that uh, how do we fund these things uh, conversation, um, and I'll I'll sort of go through how it works, and I'll give you some examples of, of how we've done it. Um, floodplain restoration is in the, the stormwater BMP manual. Um, the the section in there uh, is pretty vague because at the time no one had figured out how to quantify it yet. Um, so as a placeholder to, to acknowledge that yes, we think there's probably uh, some stormwater functions here, but there, there wasn't a quantification. Uh, there's, there's a revision to that section um, that um, at some point there's going to be a revision to the manual. I have no idea when that's going to happen. It's been, going, it's been in the works for years, but um, 
at, at any rate, there is a revision that has much more detail in it, um, a lot of which I'm going to go through quickly here. Um, but basically, these, these floodplain restoration systems can address peak volume and water quality, which are the big three things we need to deal with in terms of stormwater management, in terms of NBDS compliance. Um, and the, the modeling is, it's not something new and crazy. It's all stuff that, that is standard engineering practice, uh, just reapplied, repurposed uh, to this situation. Peak attenuation or peak rate reduction, basically this is, this is what a detention basin does. Um, is you're taking a high peak from your uh, site discharge from your impervious areas and you're, you're holding that for a little while and you're releasing it at a slower rate. Well, an active floodplain can do that too by accessing that broad, wide floodplain. And basically, you're slowing the water down and you're keeping it uh, in there for longer. And the, and the net effect is that downstream of the project site, your peak rate is, is lower than it was coming in at the top. And so I'll, we, can, we can quantify that with um, some modeling, some HECRAS, and some TR20. Um, and uh, I don't. I don't have all the details of that in this presentation, but if anyone want to talk about that afterwards, we can talk about that. Um, the runoff volume ha reduction happens in a, a couple of ways. I talked about that clay layer um, in the, the legacy sediment, and, and typically legacy sediment on the whole is, is pretty low permeability because it's, it's primarily silts and clays. And so your, your infiltration rates are low. Um, we can document that the infiltration rates at the, the, the restored floodplain elevation are, are much higher. And, and we can also show that we're accessing that restored footprint much more frequently. So while a, a two-year storm um, in the existing pre-restored condition may, just, may stay within the channel um, in a lot of cases, a lot of times those channels look convey the 5, 10, or a larger event. Um, we're taking that two-year storm and even the one-year storm um, and smaller and spreading it out over that whole footprint. So now we've, we've accessed a much larger footprint area more often and we've increased the infiltration capacity of that footprint. Um, and we put native vegetation in there that have deep root systems and are going to maintain those, those, uh, those channels. So um, there's also an evapotranspiration component here that isn't so much more difficult to quantify on a per storm basis and so um, the regs make us look at a, a two-year storm and so we haven't really looked at that but on an annual basis that evapotranspiration factor is also pretty significant if you compare uh, a restored uh, naturally vegetated system versus a lawn or a cornfield. Um, and then water quality. Um, water quality may be the easiest one to understand but there's, there's couple big components of it. Um, so we're, we're creating a right kind of buffer. Um, so all of, all of those things are, are in here as far as filtration of, of runoff uh, coming into the stream. Um, but we're also eliminating the banks as a source of sediment, which we've identified as the, the biggest source of, of sediment in, in typical, typically in the watershed. So we're cleaning the water that's coming into it, and we're also removing the source and, and we're allowing the runoff from upstream in the watershed to spread out and, and be treated as well. So visually, um, here's that same picture, existing conditions. Um, as far as peak rate, there's no attenuation happening in there. There's no storage, it's just purely conveyance. Whereas here, there's a lot of storage going on. Um, and the, the cross-sectional area taken up for a given flow rate is much greater here than it is here. And that, that relationship of cross-sectional area uh, to flow rate is, is, is key to that, that peak rate calculation. Um, in terms of volume control, again, that same system, um, at, a, at a very small storm event, we're spreading out over that floodplain. we also got some, some small pockets where wa uh, water's going to be retained. Um, and we've created this, this much more permeable surface um, that, that allows infiltration. And then in terms of water quality, um, you know, you've got this bank erosion component. Um, you've got pipes that are discharging directly to the stream. A lot of times your storm pipes go right into the stream. Um, in this case, the pipe came out a little <laughs> farther, or the stream moved, moved back. Um, 
in the restored condition, these pipes are discharging back to the edge. We'll put a little wetland pocket right on the, at that outfall to, to sort of be a final polishing pocket uh, for that discharge. And then that flow's got to go all the way across this vegetated floodplain before it hits the stream. Um, and like I said, we're eliminating the source uh, of, of sediment from the banks, and we're, we're also treating flows from upstream in the watershed. So from a stormwater management standpoint, you've got a, a development site here. Um, we've, we've got to have a stream to make this work. Um, and our conventional requirements are peak rate, we've got to meet the pre-development pre condition, our volume requirement, we've got to manage that two year, 24 hour difference. And water quality, we've got to provide uh, some measure of water quality DMPs and, and check the right boxes on the, the NBDES form. So we build houses and we put in some BMPs, some rain gardens, some disconnected uh, rooftops or parking lots or whatever. And then in the conventional system, we have a detention basin uh, because all these other BMPs are nice, but it's really tough to make, manage your peak rate uh, with those. So the alternative here with floodplain restoration is we have the same site, but now we have a restored floodplain. Uh, we have our, our same, I'm not sure why they're not coming up, but we have our same uh, requirements here uh, for peak, for volume, and for, for water quality. So we build the houses and we put our BMPs in, but in this case we can build another house or another 11 houses or whatever. And so there's value for the developer obviously because he's got more uh, units to sell. Uh, there can be value from a planning standpoint because uh, sometimes we don't get the density we want to where we want it because we have to do, we have open space requirements, we have stormwater requirements, and so um, you may get less density uh, than you want, and so then you tend to get um, more development pressure elsewhere. Um, it's also expandable, so you could potentially stack this for, for multiple sites if, if you have that, that situation, um, that you could do a large restoration project to treat maybe multiple development sites. My requirements, they showed up late. All right, so I've got three examples here of, of where this has actually been done uh, successfully. This was the first one that was approved. Um, it was a private residence, and the, the amount of earth disturbance outside of the floodplain was less than an acre, so it didn't require an NPDES permit, so it didn't need to go through DEP. It went through the township and the conservation district, um, and that, that's significant. <laughs> but um, there was some expansion going on here. There was a, a failed um, infiltration basin um, that was poorly designed, um, had about three feet of standing water in it, um, and was really not doing any infiltration. So uh, here's what the banks looked like. This is not a legacy sediment project. This was just manipulation, historic manipulation of this channel um, over time. And we found. Uh, some interesting relics when we were when we were doing trenches, um, pulled out old bricks and things um, uh, from old roadways. Um, at any rate, it was it was very in size for a, for a small system. Um, that's what it looked like. Um, this is a concept plan, uh, actually the landscape plan. So where there was a, a infiltration basin, we put a series of stepped rain gardens to to step that flow um, from the the, the, the runoff from the, the, the house and patio area was directed over into to the stormwater facilities here. So we, we maintained that path, put some stepped rain gardens in to get down to the floodplain, and then the restored floodplain uh, was here. There's an existing access drive and bridge in the middle. And that's immediately following construction. We can see the plugs uh, that were planted. Uh, very small stream system, uh, stream channel that was installed. And uh, this is a high-end residential area, so it's uh, a little bit more manicured than the typical system, but it's still all native species and um, as, as wild as they'll tolerate it. So, um, The next one is Rock Lidditz. Um, I don't know if the, the news of Rock Lidditz made it this far west, but it's a, uh, a campus um, that is intended to serve the entertainment industry 
Um, it's a partnership between uh, Claire Brothers Atomic and Tate. So Claire does audio uh, for, for a lot, well, they, all, they all do um, equipment for large concert productions. Claire does the audio. Uh, Atomic does um, pyrotechnics and lighting. Um, Tate Towers does the, the sets, the, the big structures. Um, so I think Bon Jovi, um, Alan Jackson, um, Cher, um, those are the kind of names we're talking about. And they, they put all this stuff, they build all this stuff, and then they need to test it. They need to put it all together and make sure it works before it goes on the road. And so typically what they would do is um, rent a hockey arena or something, and they'd have to set it all up and test it, and it takes weeks or months sometimes, and so they have to tear it down when there's a hockey game and put it back up. And it, it's, it's inefficient, and it's not local, so they've got to truck things. And so the idea here is these companies are all in Linux, um, and so they wanted to build a studio where they could assemble this right all right on site. Um, and Santa Domingo Creek uh, happens to run right through the site. This is upstream of the project that we looked at before. Um, the area was identified as a critical aqua for recharge area. Kelly showed you pictures of Butterfly Acres. Um, that's also a, a critical aqua for recharge area as, as identified by the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. But gives us the, the geologic conditions here are very unique, and so there's there's a lot of potential for enhanced groundwater recharge, and it's right upstream of the uh, borough of Linnitz, uh water water supply. So that's a, an important factor. Um, there's also I don't have point, this point on here, but there's also a sediment TMDL for Linnitz Run, which San Domingo is a, a primary tributary of, um, and so sediment reduction was a was a driver here from the, from the township end. Um, but this was the first uh, NPDES permit approved with floodplain restoration as a, a primary stormwater uh, practice. This is the master plan. Uh, Dirk and Edson was the um, consultant that actually did the land development plan. Um, this studio was, you'll see pictures of this building. Um, this is uh, 100 feet tall. Uh, it's the initial studio that they can do those, set up those, those productions. Um, the rest of this is not constructed yet. Uh, this will be the next uh, next phase to go, and that's that's scheduled to start later this summer. Um, it's a 96 acre campus, um, 17 acres of which is floodplain. So this was our territory, um, and our our objective was to design a floodplain restoration project here that would serve the stormwater management needs for for the site, um, with the caveat that there there are some on site, uh, there's some rain gardens, there's some, some bioswales, um, there's, there's uh, disconnection of the pavement from the storm sewer system. Um, so there's some other other practices on the site that are, that are important to deal with water quality issues before it gets there. Um, so we're not, we're not throwing it all in, in one pot here. Uh, but as far as the, um, the peak rate reduction, volume reduction, and significant amount of water quality, um, improvement far above what's required for the project. That's all happening in the floodplain. Uh, this is what it looked like. Um, it, uh, I sh this is the one with the USGS map that I showed you earlier where it was all straightened and, and uh, kind of unnatural bends in the, in the channel. Um, there's trees. There was a narrow band of trees along the, the edge of the, the bank, um, really just one row of trees. Um, but you can see that they're, they're undercut. They're at the wrong elevation. Trees are good, trees at the wrong elevation get undercut and, and uh, eventually fall in. And you can tell that these, these have fallen once and, and re sprouted. Most of them are box elders. Um, you know, so it's not a very big system, but we've, we've got two, two and a half feet of, of channel incision. Um, this is during construction. Um, so Santa Domingo Creek comes down along this property line. Uh, this is that western tributary that, that shows up on the USGS map that did not show up on the historical map. It's, it's really just a ditch between the fields. Um, historically, the, the, uh, the stream hit this, this bend, there's a little bit of a rock outcrop here, and disappeared. And so from this point downstream, um, it's, it's intermittent at best. Um, typically, uh, it's not flowing all summer long. So what we did was we put it, we constructed a temporary bypass channel to, to convey that flow around. Um, all summer and during construction, it was completely dry anyway. Um, so it really didn't matter. It's flowing. It was flowing 
as of a couple of weeks ago, barely. Um, but this is this is the, the restored floodplain. We actually did a, a, a braided or an Astemos channel system here because uh, the idea was that we want to enhance groundwater recharge and it's a losing stream reach. Um, so recharge is, is occurring through the, the, the stream bed. And so we have a braided channel system to distribute that flow all across that, that floodplain. Um, and when there is flow, it'll be recharging uh, the aquifer. So this is the, the studio building. Um, uh, phase two comes in over here, um, and there's there's additional phases here and here, uh, but that's that's what it looks like. Uh, the the cool thing is that because of this bypass channel is in, the runoff from the site gets into the floodplain, and it's sort of trapped by the berm for the bypass channel. So not a drop of water has left the site since it was constructed. Um, so it's it's 100 percent effective right now in terms of stormwater management. There's a ground level shot right after construction. And that's that's actually this spring. Um, so most of what we're seeing is just the cover crop that's, that's up, but the, the uh, natives are coming. There's also uh, over 2,000 trees planted in here. So a, a lot of this will be uh, reforested. Um, there are some warm season grass meadows that are, that are intermixed as well. You see the woody debris here. This is those are the trees that were removed from from the old stream bank. Um, we we buried them. Uh, they create they create habitat. They create carbon source in the system and, and some some roughness. So they'll break down over time, and then the trees that are planting will, will kind of come up and and, uh, and cover the site. So from a cost benefit standpoint, I, I mentioned that it was about a one million dollar design build construction project. Um, Rock lit has got an additional 200,000 square feet of, of buildable area. So throwing a dollar value to that, about $9 million of additional value to them uh, that they can uh, create uh, buildable land to sell or, or probably lease space. Um, nutrient sediment load reductions were not, uh, were, were only sort of a secondary objective. Um, the, the township was instrumental at encouraging rock lidits to, to go this route because uh, they were interested in, in sediment reductions. Um, the township has been very proactive there um, from Warwick Township uh, in terms of, of strategies to, um, to reduce sediment nutrient load reductions and there's been a lot of restoration activities in Lidditz Run. That's a whole other presentation in itself. But we're looking at 124 tons of sediment per year, um, 1,000 pounds of nitrogen and almost 200 pounds of phosphorus per year um, in load reductions. Um, it, these are these are ag um, BMP values in terms of dollars per ton, um, and so if, if you if you compare that to the comparative price for rain gardens or some other urban BMP, those values would be quite a bit higher. Um, and there's obviously ecological and recreational benefits in addition to that there's going to be a trail through here um, it, it'll be open to the public um, and certainly the, the employees there and here's here's the thing that you know a lot of times to do projects like this we go hunting for grants and we go we try to get a growing greener grant we try to get a NIFWF grant or whatever this is entirely privately funded um, a 17 acre floodplain restoration and you know, there's, it's not competing for those same grant dollars. Um, and there can be arrangements made where um, you know, maybe the township can, can, re, can partner in the project and realize some of the uh, load reduction credit. Um, so there's certainly significant opportunities there. And it, it depends on. It probably can. Yeah. We were told it was the worst done under a separate NPDS permit. Now, whether or not they change that or modify it as if we're requiring it, or these guys require it as a post construction similar management plan? What we've, been, what we've been careful to document is that the, the load reductions achieved by the restoration project are so far in excess of what the development site would even generate. So we use the, the standard worksheet 13 in the NPDES package, goes through 
calculates the, the load generated by land use, and it, it's like a thousand pounds of uh, yeah, thousand pounds of sediment versus 124 tons. Um, so you're on a different order of magnitude, and, and every step of the way we've been very careful to document that so that um, it's clear that that there's a there's a value above and beyond what was required for the NPDES permit um, in terms of load reduction. Yeah, something I'm going to check into for sure. Uh, hopefully, that was just a knee jerk response when we asked that question last time. It's not specific like this that you give us credit. Yeah, well, and if, if you ask five different people at yeah. DP, you'll get five different answers yeah, probably. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, we, we have tried to, to certify credits from floodplain restoration, and um, they, they flat out told us that they were, were really had ready to handle. They're still trying to get their head wrapped around what that means. But, um, last example I've got is uh, land is homes, which we talked about before. I mentioned they had limited available land for expansion, um, and and they actually went out on a limb. Uh, stewardship of the land is, is very important to them, and they recognized that that the stream was impaired and needed some help, and so they were willing without assurance that they were going to receive stormwater credit for this, they went out on a limb and did the project because they thought it was the right thing to do. That's unique, um, and, and so you know, they, they deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, they, they were dealing with, with resistance from the township, from the DEP, um, all through, and, and we're, we're almost there um, as far as getting the final NPDES approval. Um, they do have conditional township stormwater management approval for 11 additional cottage units that are in, in the footprint of what is now temporary detention basins. Um, they, were, they were installed as detention basins to, to keep the process moving, uh, but always intended to be temporary. Um, and like I said, the major modification that NPDES permit was pending, we're, we're just about at the end of the road there. So this is, um, this is Kirk's run. Um, actually, if you look at the USGS map, this is Kurt's run, um, but this is a straightened gabion, was a straightened gabion line channel. Um, one of the early comments we got from the agencies was, why do you want to do anything with it? It's stable. It's a straightened gabion line channel. <laughs> so um, that was some of the resistance early on. Um, this pond is, was there. It was a maintenance headache. Um, you'll see in, I think, the next slide that it was about ready to breach. Uh, due to bank erosion here. Their new campus uh, now sits right here, and you'll see some pictures of that. Um, pond is right back here. This is what the stream bank looked like in front of it. Um, so there was serious concern that that wasn't going to, to be there for very long. And that's what it looked like during construction. Uh, it gets a little bit messy. People get a little squeamish about that, but it's a temporary inconvenience for a long-term improvement. So, um, and there was a lot of efforts uh, done. Uh, B.R. Kreider was the excavator on this job, and they they are very conscientious. And there's a lot of efforts made to, to manage sediment and to to make sure that uh, we weren't discharging uh, any more than the, the little bit that was necessary. Um, this is what that straightened gabion line ditch looks like now. And that's it. The same channel, a little bit more vegetated later in the season. Actually, that was last fall. Pond would have been over here. This is looking upstream. Uh, we did have a couple of log deflectors in here. Um, DEP wanted uh, some, some habitat structures, so we put some habitat structures in. Uh, not really necessary for stability, but they um, they do provide a little bit of, of habitat. Um, and actually what you don't see here is a tow wood structure. Um, this is more in the keeping with the way it was that they were originally intended. Um, you don't really see it. There's, there's wood here though creating an undercut bank which creates habitat and it, it effectively armors the outside of that bend. Um, but again, it's a low bank so it's, it's not a real high shear stress condition anyway. You can walk right over top of those and never know you're walking on. So uh, that's that's what we aim for if we're doing structures we want them to blend uh, so they don't stand out. Uh, 
And that's in that, that snow melt condition. Um, it was intended to flood um, out around there in the middle of the walk that way. That's, that's how it's designed. And that's the, the little tributary during the flood event. So you can see the, the channel in there, but the flows uh, spread out into the, as much width as we could get. So, just an aerial shot. Um, this is where, where the pond used to be. There are some strong springs feeding some, some open water habitat there, but that's, that's only a few inches deep. Um, and there's the new campus. Here's a basin. So this is where uh, seven of those uh, 11 additional cottage units will go there, and the other four will go back in here. Uh, again, permit design permit construction costs about $785,000. Um, return on that investment for Landis Homes is about $2.9 million. So it's a good, a good trade-off for them. Um, and again, not quite as dramatic, but, but still significant sediment and nutrient load reductions. And again, ecological and recreational values. The residents love it. Um, we, we hear stories about you know different types of ducks people saw and all the different songbirds that people have seen. And so you know from that standpoint, it's a it's a real amenity to the community. Um, and again, 2,800 uh, feet of stream restoration, 5.7 acres of wetland creation, all private dollars. Uh, in the grant so um, that's that's pretty significant. Um, we'll just wrap up with some, you know, we've talked about all this stuff, but those load reductions um, depends on what your project goals are. If your project goals stormwater management, then this, these load reductions become become sort of an auxiliary benefit. Um, there, there are some a lot. There is a lot of potential for floodplain management, um, whether it be through peak rate reduction upstream or just locally lower flood uh, lo lowering local flood stages, um, aquifer recharge. Long-term stream stability because we're not just we're not putting structures in to, to armor things. Uh, we're creating a low-energy system that's inherently stable, and certainly there's habitat improvement and, and aesthetic enhancement. So I think that's about uh, the end of what I'm going to cover. Um, just think about the tools in the toolbox and what's the right tool for the job. And um, some of them do more heavy lifting. Uh, that doesn't make the other ones obsolete. There's, there's uh, uh, certainly the need for, for a full array of options. Uh, I'm going to stop there, um, I think, because we're, we're about out of time if we want to go outside. So. Any questions? Thank you, Ben.